than there's Jan Kraus Green is from Bellingham, Massachusetts. She is an author, a poet, and a storyteller who sees the common thread in what she writes and performs in uh, her circles of the art as material that explores the human heart primarily. She has written, had written a column for the Middlesex News called Homefront that was a popular feature in the 80s and 90s. And then more recently, she has been involved with a performance group called Shadow and Light Storytellers who travel to colleges, libraries, local theaters. She also is more recently involved with a comedy web series about a group of millennials. Perhaps some of her inspiration on, on that series might come from her own life also as a family person. Uh, she is a mother of five sons and a grandmother of six. Jan wrote and published her first novel in 2013. And she's currently working on a sequel novel, as well as two other nonfiction books. She is here today to talk about her novel, I Call Myself Earth Girl, published in 2013. So please welcome Jan Cross Green. Do you like um, a five minute? Uh, or? Yes, please. Where will you be? I, I am usually up here. I'm terrible with time. So. so this is what I'm going to say about my novel. This is the cover. Isn't it cool? I wrote this. It's for sale for $10 back there. There you go. <laughs> so what I really want to talk about today, I want you to think about the universe. And let's think about what we don't know. There are two major things that we don't know about the universe. So there's this stuff called dark matter, and it makes up 27% of the universe. And it's so cool because all these scientists and astrophysicists and all these people, they don't know what makes up dark matter. They know it's there because it has an effect on gravity, but they don't know what it is. And then there's this other stuff called dark energy. They don't know what that is, but it makes up 68% of the mass of energy in the universe. So here's this universe, and a lot of it, we don't know what it is. I have a theory. It has yet to show up in any scientific journal. But come with me here and let's think about this. I think that dark matter is actually the souls of all the people who have ever lived on Earth or ever will live on Earth. When you're here, you're not part of dark matter. But before you're born and after you die, you make up this mysterious dark matter. Scientists will never really be able to say what it's made of because they don't have the right instruments to find souls. But that's dark matter. And dark energy, that's the energy of all these souls. And it's also their consciousness. So they're existing up in the cosmos, and they can see and know what's going on down here on Earth, and they can even choose when they want to come to Earth and no longer be dark matter for a little while. So now, I'm going to tell you a little story about two souls who decided to come down to Earth in this century. And they're up there together, and they had said, it looks pretty good down there. Let's go to Massachusetts. They have a pretty good life there. Let's go there. And they're kind of whirling and twirling through space. And one of them somehow gets off on the wrong trajectory. Now, they both end up in Massachusetts. But one ends up here now, and one ends up here 100 years from now. So the one who's here now has pretty much the same kind of life we have. They always have running water. They always have electricity. They have enough water that they do things like wash their cars, water their grass, take a long time in the shower, plenty of water. 
electricity 24 hours a day, and tons of electric things. They drive cars or they know people who drive cars. Pretty much they can get in a car or on a bus or a boat or a train or a plane whenever they want. They go to grocery stores where there is so much food that sometimes it's even a little overwhelming. They go to buy cereal and it's like, oh, there's 20 kinds of shredded wheat here. Oh, my Lord. But they also go to the grocery store and they're like, oh, well, I'm really annoyed. They don't have the brand of mustard I like. So they live in a world of relative plenty. Now, the soul that landed over here in the future, she doesn't know that she landed in the future. She thinks she's here. Thank you. She thinks she's here at the same time as the soul who landed in the present. And she's like, so different. It's nothing like I thought it would be. It's not as green as I thought it would be. And there's hardly any water. And I had people talk about this thing, electricity. This thing that people used to have where they could just flick a switch and a light would go on. And cars, I saw cars when I was up there, and I'm not seeing people driving cars now. Why did it look so different from up there? And she's very confused, because she thinks she's here at the same time as the, the soul who came in the present. Now, because it's a story, we're going to believe that she figures out how to contact the soul in the present. Maybe it's through a dream, maybe it's psychically, but somehow, she contacts the soul in the present. And she says, aren't you shocked? Can you believe what it's like here? It's so different. It's really, really hard. And the soul in the present says, I know. It's, it is really hard, you know? The gas costs too much, and, and there's so much division. People." People are really divided. Politics is awful. It's a really, really hard time. And she's like, what the F are you talking about? I'm thinking about the fact that there's no water. Doesn't that bother you? The water is rationed, and there's no electricity, and there's People don't have cars. I mean, I guess somewhere somebody has electricity in cars, but where I am, there's not even a town government anymore. It's just like little villages of people fighting over resources, over food, over, over water. It's hard to make things grow. Where, aren't you at the same place as me? And then they begin to realize that they're not at the same place. And eventually they realize that she has landed somehow 100 years from now in the future. And she thinks about that for a minute, and she goes, oh, I understand it now. I was put here in the future. I have a purpose. I'm here to warn you so that you can warn them. That's why I'm here. So please, please tell those people. Tell them what it's like now. Tell them they have to do something so it won't be like this. Please tell them. And the soul in the present says, we already know. It's just, I mean, we worry about it. We talk about climate change. We recycle. We, we think about it a lot. But we can't do anything about it. Our government doesn't really care. And maybe some governments do, but they didn't start caring soon enough. And there are places in the world where they're still going to use a lot of coal, and they're still they're trying to use more electricity, not less. And I mean, we do care, but we really can't do anything. And she says, you've got to tell them. Let them know what it's like. They'll want to do something. And, and you know, she says, if they don't care about us, what about their grandkids? 
and their great-grandkids. I mean, this isn't going to happen all at once. So what's it going to be like for their grandkids and their great-grandkids? Get them to think about that. And the soul in the present says, I will. I'll talk about it. I mean, a lot of people talk about it. But the truth is, we're pretty much powerless. It's overwhelming. It's a huge problem. It's probably inevitable. We're helpless. And so I, stepping out of the story, <coughs> have an idea. Here is something that everyone can do, and it will make a difference. And you know what it is? It's absolutely nothing. Do nothing. And by doing nothing, what I mean is, for one hour a week, at a time of day when you would ordinarily be using electricity and driving your car, pick one hour, unplug everything in your house. Don't just turn it off. Unplug it so there's no electricity, no current going through. Now, you probably can't do your refrigerator and your oven, but unplug everything on your kitchen counters, all your charges, your printer, your computer, your DVD, your DVR, television, everything. If every household in the United States unplugged everything for one hour a week during the time that they're usually consuming electricity, we could save almost 12 billion pounds of carbon dioxide from being emitted into the atmosphere. Now, those of you who are good at math have already said, if you're saving that much in one hour, that's really a drop in the bucket because, God, imagine how much we're using in 24 hours. And you're right. But maybe some people will do it for two hours. Maybe people in other parts of the world will start doing it. And even if that doesn't happen, think about this. When there's a problem that you think you don't have an impact on, and you find one little thing to do, you take one little step, it makes you feel better. It makes you feel like maybe I can have an impact. And when you, you begin to sort of take back your power, you don't feel so helpless. So doing that one thing might make you think about doing other things. I have a list in the back, if you care to look at it, that has a bunch of little easy things we can do. But here's something else. What are you going to do with that one hour? What are you going to do with it? And I have a great idea. Take that hour and fall in love. Fall in love. Do you remember what it feels like? to be in love. Do you remember that? That when you're first falling in love, you have this, you have more energy, nothing seems impossible, you're more optimistic, you face each day with joy, sort of like there's a glow in the world that wasn't there before. Imagine if you could feel like that an hour a week. That would help you through the whole rest of the week. And this is what I think it would be great to fall in love with the ecosystem. Think about the ecosystem. That's all I have to do, go outside, sit in a chair, or go for a walk. Everywhere you look, you see things going on that you can't really see, but they're happening. You can't see photosynthesis, photosynthesis but it's helping you breathe. There's all kinds of stuff going on in the soil that you don't see, but it makes it possible for the soil to grow crops. There are birds and bees and butterflies and all of these things that are important to agriculture, pollination. There is moss and lichens and mushrooms, dragonflies. Just go outside and look at everything and fall in love with it. You'll feel so good. But if nature doesn't float your boat, that's fine. There are over 7 billion people in the world. Fall in love with all the people in the world, which is easier than falling in love with one person. 
because one person is always going to have little quirks. But seven billion people, you're not really going to know them. So <laughs> fall in love with seven billion people. And you know why? Because they're on the earth at the very same time as you. So you're connected to them. We're all connected. We're connected to each other. We're connected to all the life on earth. So fall in love with that. And if you can't fall in love with that, that's OK. Fall in love again with whoever it is that you really do love, whether it's a spouse or a child or a pet or that person you see in the mirror. I love that person a lot. Just fall in love because all of that good feeling, even if it doesn't make you do anything for the environment, all of that good feeling multiplied by all the households in the, in the country, imagine what that would be. Everybody would be feeling better, more loving, happier. So I'm asking you to join me in a revolution of love. You can participate one hour a week, but let's have a revolution of love. And if that seems unrealistic, well, I am a writer. Ursula Le Guin, another much more famous writer, has said that writers need to be realist of a bigger reality. And I say, in my writing, I'd like to try to be a realist of a better reality. I don't portray that reality, but what I try to do is open up a space in the hearts and the minds of my readers where they can carry the belief in a better reality, or the possibility of a better reality, or the necessity of a better reality. And also, I really try in my book, which I said I wasn't going to talk, talk much about, but I will tell you that a lot of unbelievable things happen in that book. And maybe that's what keeps people turning the pages. But that, getting people to believe, even just while they're inside a book, in the unbelievable, that's important. Because things that are unbelievable still hold very profound truths. So I think that even though it's not extremely realistic, we can do it. So let's try. Let's make a revolution of love. One hour a week, you can tell other people about it. I'm going to do it. I hope you do. You know, this book, I call myself Earth Girl. I'm writing the sequel to it. And the sequel is called What Happens Next. Well, it is a sequel, so that's a pretty good name. But also, it's called What Happens Next because sort of the theme of that book, although it's all fiction and also unbelievable, is that what happens next is up to all of us. And this is something I really, really believe. And it's sort of my motto, I guess. James Baldwin, at one time, this isn't going to be a direct quote, but it's going to be the gist, said that we're all responsible to life because we come down on Earth, and he says, from a terrifying darkness, and we have this time of light, and then we return to that terrifying darkness. I don't know if it's terrifying, but that's how he describes it. And he says, but while we're here, it's almost our duty to negotiate our way through life in the most noble way we can for the sake of those who come after us. And I really like that idea. It'll probably show up as a quote in my book. I have what left, like two minutes, one minute? Two. All right. This won't take two minutes. But I'm just going to read the very beginning of the sequel. And it starts with a quote by Stephen Hawking. Why do we remember the past but not the future? Two brothers watch as glowing orbs of light appear in the night sky. One feels dread. The other feels hope. One begins a new life. The other begins a quest to understand. 
A homeless man watches in awe as the orbs appear and then fade into the darkness. He has answers that will reunite the brothers. All three want to save a young boy who flees his home and begins a journey that will change his life and theirs. And the stories in this book all intertwine and they take place in this century and they take place in the next century. So thank you very much. Won't you come to my garden and dance with me? Dance and laugh and have fun. We can watch the sunflowers bloom and grow in the light of the golden sun. This moment is here now, precious and dear. Now release the future and past. Breathe in this moment, notice this moment. Make this moment last, my friends. Make this moment last. Here we go. This, this moment, this, this now. This, this moment is amazing. Wow. This, this moment, this, this now. This, this moment is amazing. Wow. Now I'm going to take you to the ocean. Won't you come to the ocean and dance with me? Dance and laugh and have fun. We can walk and splash and listen to the waves in the light of the golden sun. This moment is here now, precious and dear. Now release the future and past. Breathe in this moment, notice this moment. Make this moment last, my friends. Make this moment last. Here we go. This, this moment, this, this now. This, this moment, this amazing wow. This, this moment, this, this now. This, this moment, this amazing wow. Now, I also love to be alone. And so it goes, I am all by myself and dancing with me, dancing and laughing, having fun. I am grateful for every single moment in the light of the golden sun. This moment is here now, precious and dear, now release the future and past. Breathe in this moment, notice this moment. Make this moment last, my friends. Make this moment last. Here we go. This, this moment, this, this now. This, this moment, this amazing wow. This, this moment. Let's all breathe in and out. One, two, three. Wow! Thank you. The doctors, they call it perimenopause. Sleepless nights, short temper, explosive diatribes, passionate beliefs, and that dreaded hot flash. But I know now that I am an autumn tree burning red before I lose all my leaves and bear my branches for the coming winter. And I know that splendid alchemy accompanying my passage, and the brilliant hue of scarlet that changes my nurturing green leaves into something much, much more. A chemical passion sweeps through my body, altering every cell, and I am totally unprepared for the ultimate beauty of it all. As I walk through autumn foliage, I laugh with glee at the changing scenery where pastoral backgrounds become fiery infernos of yellow, orange, and red. The leaves burn with fury and excitement before finally letting go and dropping to the ground. The winds howl, swirling leaves for a whirlwind ride, and the rain, yes, the rain cries and cries and cries and washes the rest of the leaves down. Finally, after a most glorious season, the trees are bare, and with branches outstretched, reaching to the heavens above, 
They take in all the splendor of the, the co they take in all the cosmic splendor of the starry skies above. Thank you. Cinderella's Castle and every day on Main Street there's a parade without politicians. Just mice, some dogs, and a conscience-driven cricket when you wish upon a star. At the Muppet 3D Theater, a little yellow bird swoops from the screen and hovers before us. My mother laughs, delighted. To hear her laugh again, she is the first woman I loved and the one I have loved the longest. Poolside at the Caribbean Disney Resort, I drink Diet Coke and listen to steel drums. Vacation in Florida. It's a small world after all. Thank you. Frozen in time. The trail cuts through trees, binds together the sculptures, which are framed by shadows and a glint of sun, suspended in the moment. Three damsels, armor-plated in shining silver garb, cluster in the safety of the woods. No glimpse of leg or breast. Only their clothes stand up to face the world. Metal skirts bind tight to guard against it escape. No arms can move beyond the stiff confines of metal sleeves. Where are the women underneath? Trapped and made invisible by a world of what should be. Their wordless cries are silent, static, lost in a land where the reality of female flesh cannot exist. A visitor is free to pause and look, then pass on by, able to move through time while statues embalmed in silence can only dream of what might once have been.